We're going to be talking about Copper Spice and signals and slots. Copper Spice is a library we've developed. We're going to go into some of the details of it. We're also going to talk about our new signal slot library and how we refactored that into Copper Spice. Then we're going to go into um, how we implemented reflection using C++, actually C++ 11. Copper Spice is a collection of libraries. It's not just one library. It is a derivative of Qt, if you're familiar with Qt, and there's several different libraries involved with it. The powerful thing is that we are LG, LGPL. It is written in C++ 11 completely. We developed Copper Spice using uh, the build system for auto tools, and a contributor did the CMake files for us, which was wonderful. So we haven't actually checked through that. Um, we have some people that are going to be looking at the CMake files. It completely builds. It absolutely works. And it's great to be able to support both build systems, because some people want one, some want the other. The powerful thing about Copper Spice is that we got rid of Mock. Um, do we have any Qt users, people that are familiar with Qt? Yeah. Mock is gone. So there's no more Mock. There's no more QMake. That's why you don't need a proprietary build system anymore. A real quick timeline just to show you. We just wanted to say that we came out with our first version of Copper Spice two years ago. A um, couple days ago, we just uploaded version 1.3. We're introducing the signal library, which we're showing you today, and just as a reference of where Qt 5.6 is. Just a quick reference. Mock. So for those of you who have used Mock, and it sounds like several of you have, you may have looked at the output of Mock. If so, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of string tables consistent in there. There's a lot of casts that are quite ugly to a modern C++ programmer's eyes. Everything is turned into a void star at some point during the signal activation system. There's also an issue that Mach is written in Qt, which means, of course, that there's a bootstrap problem because you need Qt to build Mach to build Qt. So that was a long and complicated system that we had to work through in the process of developing Copper Spice. The reason why we were looking at all these things was we were asking ourselves, do we want to contribute to Qt, or do we want to fork and become some new thing? And we looked at what it would take to create our vision in Qt and the patches that it would require and how much changes would be required in the core functionality of Qt. And we decided to strike out in a new direction. Nothing against the Qt project, but their goals are not the same as ours. And we felt that we would be better served going in a different direction. The CLA was also an issue. If you're curious about that, you can read their CLA. There's some problems we felt with the Qt CLA that you, um, they can put your changes into the proprietary or non-proprietary to the open source version and they have control over that. So there were some things and it just came down to we really wanted four years ago when we started this to move right into 11 and they're just starting with C++ 11. Um, put in some pretty check marks of things we've already accomplished. We have two in gray here. Uh, because we have done a few things. It, we have extended the API. For instance, um, QMAP, which is very similar for those of you that haven't used Qt, STD map, but we have added some of the sorting that wasn't in Qt. We have that in Copper Spice. And we've added a lot of use of smart pointers. We fixed atomics, we've done some other things. So we're in the process of making Copper Spice a completely different product, something completely better. Like I said, we're going to be showing the signal library, and we're also going to be refactoring QString. We're going to be changing all the containers to leverage the STL. And improving code along the way, as Barbara mentioned, using the native C++ atomics. There is one spot in Qt, deep within the atomic library, where there's a comment that says, assume volatile means atomic. <laughs> that is no longer there in Copper Spice. And we did let them know, and, and they are going to change it when they can, uh, I think they have to break some compatibility stuff. So they're very much aware of it, and they really did appreciate that we found that for them. So, signals. So a signal slot connection activation. We're going to be breaking down each one of these pieces as we talk about our signal slot library. Boost signals. So 
Many people in this room may be familiar with Boost Signals 2, which is widely used in the community. It's a wonderful library. I've used it. However, it didn't fit the Copper Spice slash Qt model at all. And one of the reasons is that in Boost Signals, signals are objects, which means that they have storage associated with them, which means if you add a signal to your class, you're changing the binary interface of your class. And that was a, a feature that we felt didn't fit very well in the existing Qt Copper Spice scenario. The other thing that is sometimes painful with Boost Signals 2 is while it is thread safe and you can use it in a multi-threaded program, sig when a signal is emitted from a thread, the slots are called in that same thread, which is often not what you want. And you, we, so we have really coined a term of thread aware. Yeah. Uh, we know that's a term that's used a few other places, but we're referring to that the Boost Signals 2, it's not thread aware, you can't cross threads. Whereas in Copper Spice, as we were starting to work on the signal library, we were taking everything out of Copper Spice to make it a standalone library. That's what we're showing. Signals are methods. And we wanted it, and it is in Copper Spice, it is thread aware. And we needed to maintain that so that you can call a signal and slot from a different thread. And what this means is that in this signal library, as well as in Copper Spice, the receiver is in control of how signals get delivered to that receiver. And this library is completely thread aware, as well as being thread safe. So in Copper Spice, just to give us um, some examples to work with, Q push button, if the Q bothers you, you can just ignore the Q. That's just everything, every class, every object has a Q in front of it. So the push button, clicked would be a signal method. In Copper Spice, there is a macro that uh, generates the um, signal method that you're going to need. In Qt, this is done by mock. So that's one of the first real differences between what Qt did and what, Cop and what we have done in Copper Spice, is that we have used macros in your H file to create the signal method. Now, specifically note the difference in the functionality of activate between these two scenarios. In Copper Spice, activate is a template. It receives all of its arguments as template parameters. It has full type information about them, can manipulate them just the way any C++ code could. In Qt, activate is not a template. It is a method, and it receives all of its parameters as an array of void stars, which means you lose all type information, which has to be reconstructed later on. And we'll show you more about that in a, in a little bit. So when you're looking at um, Q object, and this is the activate, this is what we're actually looking at. Ours is a templated method, which is something that they can't do because of mock. They can't, you can't um, have anything that uses templates. Um, every time you have activate, it is called, and activate is internal to the library. So activate is called based on the signal method, is what we're really trying to say. Multiple slots can be connected to a given signal. Again, very similar to what you're seeing in Boost Signals 2, except that the signal is, it is a method. So, having the library. So what we did is, we looked at everything that was in Copper Spice, and we said, what do we need to push out? Where do we need to start? So what we did was we created three classes, a signal base, slot base, and pending slot, which um, is about data uh, delivering. So this allowed us to take everything in Copper Spice, push it out, create a standalone library that we could then BSD, not LGPL, which gives you an advantage. And I'm just going to start throwing it out. This is a library you can use without Copper Spice. So the signal library is something that stands independent. So good places to use this signal library. Well, if you're using Boost Signals 2 and you like the interface, awesome. If you aren't particularly a fan of the interface, take a look at ours. But it's particularly useful if you want thread-aware signal delivery. If you are using signals in a heavily multi-threaded program, it's extremely valuable to be able to send, effectively, messages from one thread to another 
in a concurrent, thread-safe, non-blocking manner. You can use this in your application, even if you have no GUI. Yes. So, so how do you actually make a, a target thread run your uh, slot code? Uh, we'll we're we're, we're going to show you how to make a connection. We do have some slides which cover that. Well, I'm interested in the implementation. Maybe, you know, uh, yes. Uh, hold that thought for a moment, <laughs> and then if we don't address it shortly, let mm -hmm. me know. So again, um, for people who aren't really using signals and slots, it is a, it can be equivalent to a callback. It is a way of dealing with reactive programming. Um, the thing we did want to stress is, although we've created this library, and we've written an interface from Copper Spice to use our own library. This is something you can use as a standalone library without a GUI, and you will gain a lot of the uh, great advantages that we've delivered, again, that we can be able to have a signal and a slot in different threads. We want to mention something because Ansel and I program um, tandem programming. So everything we do, we're side by side. And communication is a real interesting issue um, even sitting close together. And I had a really bad habit of saying reference a lot. And usually when I said reference, I meant L value reference. Sometimes when I said reference, I meant any type of reference. It's extremely confusing. So I'd like to take this moment as a public service announcement <laughs> to say, please, stop using the word reference by itself. It's a poor form of communication. Yeah, it, it was times where, because I do a lot of the typing, even with a broken finger, and it's like, okay, we're using a reference in L value, and so we now really use L value reference. We're bringing this in because we're going to make a point about an R value in our library. So we need to talk about an R value reference. And of course, the problem with R value references is that many things which look like R value references aren't. And I suspect many people in this room are aware of this, but some may not be, that if you have ampersand ampersand in a context where the type to the left of it is deduced, that ampersand ampersand is not actually declaring an R value reference. It may be some other type of reference depending upon what gets deduced. That's a forwarding reference. Um, you'll find older texts sometimes talk about generalized references, but I think that term is falling out of favor in the community. And this is extremely important to understand when you're reading specifically templated C++ 11 or newer code. You will confuse the heck out of yourself if you don't have this at the top of your mind all the time in parameter declarations. So when we're looking at our signal library, one of the first things we, we needed to bring over was an enum because we need to declare um, whether it's an auto, direct, queued, or blocking. And these do roughly what they sound like. Yeah. An auto connection is the default, and what that means is if the sender and receiver are in the same thread, the um, uh, slot will be invoked immediately on that same thread. If they are in different threads, then the slot invocation will be queued for later processing by the receiver's thread. You can then, of course, uh, yes, sir? So I think you're addressing one of the distinctions between um, this and Boost Signals 2, because in Boost Signals 2, even a cross-thread signal slot would be called immediately. Um, there is, as of the last time I looked at it, no cross-thread signal delivery in Boost Signals 2, uh, as I recall. I kind of disagree with you. I think that's one of the things that Signals 2 introduced. Signals, the first signals implementation didn't, had no thread awareness. The second signals implementation was hardened against cross-thread signals delivery. Um, the, so Boost Signals 2 is multi-threaded in terms of you can have a signal, a particular signal being emitted by multiple threads simultaneously. But it cannot, to the best of my knowledge, and I've, I've used it fairly recently, it cannot deliver a signal from one thread to another thread. Okay, yes, it is still the invoking thread providing cycles to the recipient. Right. But yeah. it's an immediate delivery. So right. you're saying that with this, yes. it will put the cycles of the invocation on the recipient thread. Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's significantly different. Yeah. And yeah. that's the default behavior. So with auto connection, if the sender and receiver belong to different threads, 
then the signal invocation will be queued and processed at a later time on the recipient's threat. And, and, and of course you can, you can do the blocking the if that three. was what you needed. Yeah. yeah, and you can wait for the signal delivery yeah. to finish using yeah. a blocking queued connection as well. Is there any other flow control besides queued and blocking? You, there's a lot that we have a lot of virtual methods in here. Well, a couple that you can actually overwrite to do like your own thread pools. Yeah. If that answers. Well, you know, the usual thing is like there's a, a link that your receiver can receive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is there any flow controls or um, back channel so the receiver can say, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm busy, stop sending stuff. There isn't any mechanism for that natively in the library, no. Um, you would have to handle that through a side channel, which may be a signal sent from the recipient thread back to the sending thread that I'm busy. to say, I'm busy, you know, yeah. throttle your connection or what, what have you. Um, but no, that's not directly handled in this library. Yet. Yes. Yet. Yet. <laughs> and of course, Yet. the obligatory patch is welcome. Yes, we are. Patches are welcome. It's BSD. Yes. Okay, go on. If, if, the, if the clicker works. Yeah. So a connection consists of all of these pieces. Um, the sender, which is a const reference, a signal, which is a method pointer, the receiver, which is a const reference, a slot, which is a method pointer, function, a lambda, and then the connection. Slightly different for people who have used Qt or looked at Copper Spice, um, and we will get to quoted strings. Hold that but question quoted that. strings aren't in the signal library, but they are in Copper Spice. So here is a declaration. This is the connect templated function. It's fairly straightforward. It merely takes those four arguments plus the optional fifth argument that states how you want the signal to be delivered. And there is an overloaded version that will accept lambdas. This is the version that assumes both the signal and the slot are methods. So doing a connection, we're showing one that's a little bit odd because we're showing Q push button, which is an R value, which is why we wanted to bring it up. So in this case of an R value, I'm going to mention this code is compliant and it does work. What it does is very interesting though because this R value is going to bind correctly to the reference that we have. However, when we hit the semicolon, we're not going to hit the destructor of Q push button. The destructor of Q push button is then going to now remove everything from our connection list. So this line is actually a very expensive no op because the sender in this case is a temporary and is about to expire. So the truth is, using we should be using a different reference, and that's why we're talking about the fact of the fact that we're using R value and const references. We really shouldn't be doing it this way, although it's not an error, although it's not a problem. We would like to change, and to change this involves some very interesting um, statics that we have not quite worked out. Could I see the previous slide again, please? Sure. Uh, yeah, that yeah, so that's, that's where we're having an issue. We, we've tried it a few ways, but it's very expensive in what we're doing right now. It turns out to be non-trivial yes. to, to do a static assert yes. that will fail if a parameter is deduced to be an R value. So it doesn't cause a problem, but it would be better to be able to say, you've passed an R value. Then Can't. that removes the ability to pass a const Const object yeah. in this position. And that's one of the requirements for the library. Um, conceptually, making a connection between two objects does not change the state of either of the objects. So we want to allow you to make a connection between two objects that are const. So we did need R value reference, we did need a const, and, and having an L value and a const reference, R value is the right way once we can be able to do a static assert correctly. We've tried a couple different variations. Um, like I said, they've been very expensive, and then it blocked too many things out. Why not just delete it? Um, that turns That's, out to not be possible. Yeah, it's not possible. Because this is a template, yes. there is no way to make an argument that only accepts an R-value reference. 
because this is a deduced type, that is a forwarding reference. So it will accept any reference type. You can enable if you can use it to join the jurisdiction. We tried it enable if, and we ran into cons problems. So we've been around the barn a few times. We're, we're working with a couple of people on it, and we're open to more ideas. But since it doesn't cause, it's not a compiler error, it's not a runtime error, and the truth is you shouldn't be passing an R value. Mm -hmm. So this is But just, we wanted to bring it up as an, we thought it was an interesting point. This is just in the spirit of making meaningless code not compile, which is yes. a good thing. Yeah. So, yes. So I'm kind of curious as to why the um, receiver and the slot method are two distinct arguments. I would think maybe just accepting an arbitrary C++ callable, you know, kind of like what uh, Signals 2 does. Um, there's a very good reason why we can't do that, and that is the reason why Signals 2 can't do cross-thread signal delivery, because it doesn't know what the receiver is. It has no way to ask the receiver, what thread are you in? How should I deliver this message? Okay, so there's a protocol that the receiver implements. Yes, yes. and we'll get to that shortly. Ah. Sorry, there was no way to do all the slides at the exact same time. <laughs> <laughs> Had to pick some order. So anyway, we went through this. Um, disconnect does exactly what you think it is. We wanted the slide in here. Obviously, you don't need the last parameter because we don't need the enum. Um, so disconnect isn't that interesting, but it is there and very valuable. The activate function, like we said, you don't call activate directly. Activate is called by the signal method. And we'll show you some examples. We'll show you some examples of that. And here it comes. So this um, clicked is what is generated by our macro. And clicked would also, if you're looking at the cute side of it, activate is the same thing. Um, except if you were looking at cute code and you were looking at the mock generated, what you would see is a slow avoid stars in here. Which you'll see later in the... Yeah, we have a little bit of that. But this is what it looks like. And it's not something you have to change. It's just here for you. Um, and in fact, when we were starting to do this, at one point, we were like, how do we generate um, these signal methods? And at one point, Ansel said, well, we'll just write them. At which point, we did a rough count, and there's like 1,500 just in the libraries, let alone what would be in your code. So we decided it had to be automated. People have said, why do we have the macro there to generate this method? It's because it should be auto-generated for you. One of the good uses, I feel, of a macro. So, you mentioned about uh, a protocol that the receiver implements, and here's the first part of it. And this is one thing that was not available in Qt, and is not available in boost signals, either one or two. And that is, what happens when an exception is thrown? There's no ability to provide a policy for handling exceptions in any of those systems. The cute policy is don't use exceptions ever. So if you throw an exception, the whole world will come crashing down. That's not what we wanted to do as a modern C++ library. The boost signals um, answer, as I recall, is if a, thought, if a slot throws an exception, that slot is disconnected. Well, that's not necessarily what you want either. You can provide a custom combined. <laughs> In this case, what this is is there is a virtual method called handle exception that you can override, which is past an exception pointer of whatever exception some slot through. You can handle it any way you like. By default, exceptions are swallowed, and subsequent slots will be called, but you can do whatever you, you wish. So this um, method is implemented on the receiver? Yes. OK, so the receiver customizes. Uh, pardon me, no. This no. is the sender. Sender. This method is in the sender. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes. This method is implemented in the sender. Altitude. So, yes. <laughs> and it is called when the receiver throws an exception. Yes. It is and called when a slot. And we pass the receiver. information through. Uh, we've done some stuff so that we're repeating the, everything. So you, you have the condition. Mm -hmm. uh, but we decided, because some people really don't want to handle exceptions. Mm -hmm. And we like handling exceptions, but that's not fair to say that the library should. So we're just going to pass it through and let you decide what to do with it. So this is one of the, the hooks into the library that you can override right. as you yeah. wish. This is the one in the sender. And then there are two hooks in the receiver that you can provide. 
So the first one is queue slot. This is how a slot invocation is actually queued. The, call the receiver is in charge of that signal delivery, if you will. So it receives a pending slot, which is a function object that wraps up a bunch of information about the invocation. And the default implementation simply calls it immediately. So out of the box, the CS signal library is not thread aware. But by overriding this hook, you can hook into whatever threading system, thread pool, whatever you have existing in your legacy code, or design some new system that wasn't anticipated. OK, so this is how the recipient thread can provide cycles for the slot call. Yes. It's up to the custom override of QSlot. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And this is in the receiver class. So the receiver gets to state how it wants its signals to be delivered. Now, if you think about it, this is a really powerful technique because you could have two different libraries in the same process, using each using their own thread pool system. And they can communicate with each other, each one being delivered signals in its preferred format through its main loop, however it wants to receive information. Then that's halfway to having a fully implemented receiver. The other thing you have to implement is compare threads. And this is only needed if you are using the default auto connection, connection type, because we have to be able to ask, am I in the correct thread to deliver this signal to the receiver? So compare threads is called from the sending thread in the receiver object and it returns true or false based on whether that signal should be queued. And if you implement those two methods, you can use this signal library with any existing threading system that you have, be it Microsoft threads, POSIX threads, C++ 11 threads, whatever you like. So auto, with an auto connection, um, when you invoke a slot, um, it first checks compare threads, and if it says true, they're the same thread, then it immediately fires the slot. If it does not, it calls that Q slot. We're, retur exactly. we're returning, returning true right now. This would be something you override yes. in, in terms yes, of it. Right. Yes. yes, that's correct. Yeah. But that's the logic exactly. in the delivery of an auto slot. Yes. yes. Indeed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? Okay. So what we're showing in here is just what the declaration would look like in your H file. Uh, this is that signal macro that's going to generate the clicked and um, then give you the call to activate. And as you can see, the slot is just a method. It's There's just a method. There's nothing special about it. It's nothing. any method or it mm -hmm. could have been a lambda. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Copper Spice, which looks a little bit more like the cute arena, we do need a macro for the slot, and that has to do with registration information, which we'll go over. But that's the big difference, is that in Copper Spice, we need macros for both the signal and the slot. There's things we have to do in the signal library. We only need the macro for the signal method. And here's what it would look like in your CPP file of calling. We've left out, obviously, some of the, the things that make sense in terms of what my button is. And Ginger is just a class which we use as a sample quite a bit. Now I'll contrast this with the next slide, which is what this looks like in Copper Spice. Note that there are two forms of connect here. And in Copper Spice, there's a third form that's supported, which allows you to pass the signal and the slot names as strings. This is a form that's supported for backward compatibility. It's not as efficient as the form which uses method pointers. Or lambdas, yeah. Or lambdas. However, there are cases where you're using plugins or reflection that it is useful to be able to construct a connection call using strings at runtime. So this needs to be supported in the Copper Spice core library, whereas this functionality isn't available in CS Signal. So in the process of integrating our own library, becoming our own customer, we have integrated the library back with Copper Spice. In um, Copper Spice and, and also in Qt, QObject is the main class that you're always dealing with. It's the base class. Everything inherits from QObject, like QDialog, QPushButton, and QTreeView. What we noticed at the point that we had the signal library working, it's like time to integrate. 
we started looking at what QObject really was. And it was amazing. There was a lot of functionality, which we didn't need anymore. And it's rather large. So we figured we should show it to you. But we had to use a pretty small font. <laughs> so this is Qt4. Nothing against it. It's just, this isn't QObject. This is just the structure for connection. So, so this is what they have in terms of what it takes to do a connection. Because there's a raw pointer to sender and receiver. So this connection object is part of two linked lists simultaneously, which is confusing at best. It has a bunch of extra information uh, that delves into the internals of the Qt signal activation system. And this has to be maintained in a thread safe manner because signal and slot connections are thread safe, or at least they are claimed to be it's thread hard. safe. We found some issues. I, I can absolutely believe that all of the bugs which have been found in this area have been fixed. Found, yes. But we, that's not the same as saying it's data race free. We also wanted to show what was in Qt5, so upgrading. So it should obviously be when you upgrading. design new code, you should refactor it, you should improve it, you should make it simpler. <laughs> so here's a little bit more. It takes a little bit more in Qt5 to maintain this connection. Let's just go right to what we did. There. Signal base. So this is what we have now. This is what it takes to do a connection. It was things that you would think of would be very obvious, and they did become obvious. We don't need all the references now to a sender and a receiver because we're either in a signal base or, or a slot base. So a lot of stuff drops out. The it's connection got a lot easier. And now we're just using a vector, an what's STD vector. What's really amazing is when you refactor a large piece of code and you end up with two separate code bases, which put together are smaller than the original code. It's really a wonderful thing. Bento Abstract is just some internal containers that we have. And you would see them in the signal library and in Copper Spice, just to store some data. And here is what we need in slot base and possible need. senders. We need a list of the senders that may potentially be sending us signals so that we can clean up. We, we were surprised. It got a lot smaller. Yes. So that's for disconnection? Disconnection yes. and, and. and the forced disconnection that occurs during destruction of either the receiver or the sender. So it got a lot simpler, a lot easier to maintain. And faster. And faster. <laughs> so QObject now uses multiple inheritance. Um, which in Qt4, Qt5, and even in Copper Spice, up until a month ago, Q, class QObject did not inherit from anything. So this was a great, perfect example of when multiple inheritance is the right choice. And we were able to remove even more obsolete code. Improved readability. The amazing thing was the destructor. The destructor was a couple hundred lines of code for QObject. It's not anymore because we're just calling destructors now in signal base and in slot base. And everything's handled where it should be. And those destructors are a dozen lines each because the data structures are simple and straightforward and easy to work with. And threading and locking is now easier because we're not trying to lock this constructor and all the locks are now happening in the signal and slot base. So we have a different case now in the destructor that it happens quicker for QObject. Things aren't locked as long. So we wrote a bunch of wrappers and we reintegrated it back in and like we said, it's faster and it's smoother. It's giving us a lot of power. And then we said, well, wait a second, there's gotta be more that we can change. And hopefully that's the next slide. So before, we, so we were able to shrink QObject and we said, well, does this really work in thread safe? Ansel got to finally play with Clang Thread Sanitizer, and he was jumping up and down with excitement. Um, if you're not using Clang Thread Sanitizer and you're doing threading, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful. We I'll, found some problems. I'll make that statement slightly stronger. If you're not using Clang Thread Sanitizer and you have a multi-threaded application, you have a data race you don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you. Um, we actually found data races in, for example, the QThread class which one would assume was written by people who understood multi-threading. And they probably did, but they didn't have Clang Thread Sanitizer. 
and we found problems in the, the networking library and in the WebKit library, which we've cleaned up. But we found that because we were able to take the signals and slots, put them in a separate library, and run the sanitizer. It was a combination of everything. And one of the huge benefits of this refactoring was now when Thread Sanitizer said you have a problem there, the code was so much simpler and the data structures were so much simpler, you could actually tell why there was a data race happening. So we found another example that was very inter interesting to us looking at QFuture and QFuture Watcher. Remember we've said that Q object in Q can't inherit um, from a template because of mock problems and the way mock is set up. So the way they're doing QFuture and QFuture Watcher requires a QFuture Watcher base because templates can't be used. The really fundamental problem with this is so QFuture is very similar to an STD the future. future. And incidentally, if you're asking where QPromise is, it's an internal implementation detail that is not exposed in the API, which is quite odd. But QFuture works much like STD Future, and there is no way for it to emit a signal when data has become available. This seems like a really nice feature to have. So QFuture Watcher is a separate object that attaches to a QFuture and emits a signal when the data is available. Unfortunately, since you cannot put signals in a templated class, that signal which says data is now available could not be templated. So it doesn't actually give you the data that has become available. It just gives you a notification that you should go look in the future to find out what data is there now, which is extremely annoying and surprising to C++ programmers. So we decided why not have QFuture inherit from signal base and slot base? And this again was showing us the power of what we did with our own signal slot library, was now we can go through and we can clean up things like this in Copper Spice. So it's using signals and slots correctly. We can put QPromise in, bring it back out where it should be, and we don't need the watcher and three levels of indirection. Then it will actually work the way it's supposed to. We're going to shift into talking about registration because we mentioned that um, the um, H files, that we have these macros, and we need to register some information. This is the Copper Spice side of it, and we felt that this was an important piece to show on how to do the registration. And so, as mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you can use strings for the arguments to connect mm -hmm. for the signal and slot, and there are other places where they're used in similar ways in Copper Spice. And we had to support this. And so what we needed was some way to associate a string with a method pointer and then look it up at runtime and make that connection. And so we want a map where the key is a string and the value is a method pointer. And there's other information in there as well, but that's the basic idea. So the question is, how do you do this? Because C++ doesn't have reflection. There's no reflection, as we know, in no runtime reflection. And it's not built in. So we needed some way to do reflection so that we could actually see things at runtime. And we would really love for reflection <laughs> to be in the language, but, <laughs> but until we it is, copper spice now. And this is how we got rid of mock. And as you know, there's various types of things that are called reflection. What we're talking about is the type of reflection where you're modifying the data, the methods, and the properties at runtime. We're not talking about the RTTI or introspection, actual full reflection. So we want to do, at compile time, we want to do some things with the H file, do everything in terms of initializing the macros. At runtime, we want these methods to register so that we can find them when we need them later on. The registration of this metadata, um, it occurs the first time any particular class, whether it's Q push button or Q tree view, is instantiated. So we can do this registration in a lazy fashion yes. and not have to pay a, a high startup cost. Yeah. But the problem is, you have signals and slots all over your class definition. They're in unpredictable places. Some of them are public, some of them are private. They're in no particular order. There's no naming scheme to them. How do we somehow capture information about each one of these macro invocations that we can then register data? And it turns out to require 
all okay. of these pieces of C++. And we were willing with Copper Spice to require 11. That's one of the differences with, with Qt, is that they want to maintain older compilers, which is a great choice. We just wanted to move forward and use 11, and we used all of this. So really so, what we were trying to do is to say, here's what we actually want. What we really want to do is be able to call CS register 0 and have it chain and call CS register 1. So this is the exact code we wanted to write. There's only a small problem as it's not valid C++ code. Because obviously method overloading works with data types because that's, that's the definition of method overloading is different methods with the same name that receive different types of parameters. And we don't have different data types. So not, not in the zero and the one. So how could we do this? The other piece we're going to need heavily is const expert because we need to compute everything that's involved for registration at compile time because we need to set up this whole registration mechanism. I just wanted to mention in case people haven't worked with macros as much, uh, what we're using in here is where we were showing in the H file, the, and we're showing just the, the uh, CS slot 1 and CS slot 2. It's on line 42 and 43, so that just evaluates to value 42 and value 43. We need that on the next slide. Just wanted to remind people how that works. We just need this to generate unique names. Unique names. So again, so, we're, we're back to the beginning of how do we take the 0 and 1. They're integers. We can't do the method overloading based on 0 and 1. So how do you turn an integer into a data type? We have a data template. Yes. Very good. Absolutely. The answer to every Everything. how do I question in is, C++ is, usually involves is, templates. templates. And templates allow you to pass a data type as a parameter. And that's the way they're usually used. But of course, you can pass a non-type parameter to a template. Integers are definitely allowed. And the important thing is that passing an integer to a template creates a unique data type that is different from every other instantiation of that template. So how do we do this? What does this look like in our solution? Well, we have a fairly simple template class. The <coughs> main part of this class, we have csint, which we'll refer to as a wrapped integer. That's how I think of it. And you have an integer parameter that you can pass. It is then exposed as a data member called value. This is a const expert data member, and that's very important that it be const expert. And then an integer inherits from the integer one less than it. And then down here, we have a base case for the integer of zero inherits from no one. And so notice, we haven't just wrapped the integers. We've set up an inheritance relationship so that 3 inherits from 2, 2 inherits from 1, 1 inherits from 0, and then 0 is the end of the recursion. This is part 1. <laughs> the yeah. other piece is, like I said, Ginger is a test class that we use a lot. So this code is expanding from a macro that would be at the top of your code. So what you're seeing in this public in here is a couple lines of code which would expand out that is part of our, our macro system. So what do we do with this macro? Well, we declare a templated method that does nothing, that will take any wrapped integer, and we declare a non-templated method that takes a wrapped zero and returns a wrapped zero. Okay. Not this very may not seem immediately <laughs> obvious why this is useful. Then, in the body of your class, in the expansion of one of the registration macros, you will see this code. The top part would be what we said was line 42. This part in here is line 43. And the question is, what, what is, is value, value 42 and value 43? Does anybody have any ideas how to work out what these variables become? So when you call CS counter with that CS int thing, it should find the uh, overload the largest integer less than or equal to the value that you give it because of the inheritance should be set up. The, the, the CS int 255. Yeah. So yes. what number do we get for value 42? So 
point. Just as a reminder, the colon colon value value was the member variable. Every so often we have people, where did value come from? That's part of the class on the previous slide. So the way I like to look at this is... Wait a minute, we're not going to let anyone guess? <laughs> Nobody's going to guess? Any other guesses? Any guess? I can do it in my head, but it'll take a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead. <laughs> so the way I like to look at a decal type like this, this is an expression decal type, and I like to look at that as a hypothetical question. If I were to evaluate this expression at this point in the program, what data type would it evaluate to? Well, we're calling this method called CS counter, and we're passing it a wrapped 255. Go back two slides. <laughs> and or three. The there. only declaration of CS counter that's in scope is this one. The zero. And since 255 inherits from 254, inherits from 253, eventually inherits all the way up to zero, we will call this version get back a wrapped zero. Then we can apply the colon colon value yielding zero at compile time, which means value 42 is zero. Because it's a const expert. We did throw the const in. It's obviously that const is not required for 11, but it is for 14. So then we declare a new overload of CS counter using the value we just retrieved, which is zero, and adding one in both cases. So this declares a new overload of CS counter that takes a wrapped one and returns a wrapped one. So now we're sitting at this line with a one. Now, down here, I again ask the question, if I were to call CS counter with a 255, what would I get back? And the compiler looks at the inheritance hierarchy and says, ah, the version that takes a wrapped one is slightly closer in the inheritance hierarchy than the version that takes a wrapped zero. Therefore, I will give you back a wrapped one, because that's the return type of this overload, and then we can apply colon colon value, and we get back one. So we have stored our counter in the overloaded method table. Yes. That tactic seems so generally useful that I actually would love to see you extract that from CS <laughs> this is, it's actually part of copper spice. It's not in CS signal um, because we don't need it in CS signal. It, it is part of copper spice. Um, and we can. We, we can make it stand alone. Um, but it is literally 10 lines of it code. Is, it is very, very small code. I mean, we're actually showing you. I mean, this is, this the, is code. the code. This is the whole this code is. that you need to implement this. Right. But this is the kind of thing where. Um, you might say, I remember seeing something about this, but darn if I can work out what it was. <laughs> well, we'll just have to give you our email address and you can keep talking. Are yes. you certain that this is well formed? Yes, we yes. are. And I because will address that in a moment. We, we, are, we are sure it's well formed, and I, I will say that we have checked with some people on the, stand, people on the standards committee. And we've had the code reviewed by two very prominent people who have both blessed it. And the reason why it's at 255, it doesn't need to be quite that high. Um, Clang will let us go to 255, GCC would let us go to 1,000. We only need a value of about 60. And we were actually asked, was 255 a waste? And it turns out not to matter. And we'll tell you why that doesn't matter. But my favorite thing about this piece of code is the fact that we have an expression here that is const expert and evaluated at compile time. And we have the exact same expression here, character for character, that is const expert evaluated at compile time and they evaluate to different numbers. We like the laughter. It's fun. This is, yes, I'm sorry, you had a question. Well, coming back to the 12 form stuff, are you sure this, the fact that you add overloads and that, you know, the fact that it's in all in a class and it's kind of two times, you know? Yes, that, there, yeah, there's a good reason. I'll address that in a we, second. We will. So hold I, that question a moment. <laughs> so what we now want to show is this is now the expansion of really what happened in our code in terms of copper spice. We were showing just value 42. So here we're kind of showing more what's really happening. And so what we have is up here we compute the current value of the counter, increment the counter, and then we have the actual registration method. This one is going to be number zero because value 42 is zero. We're going to do our registration. The details aren't particularly important here. We're just registering some data and then we're going to call CS register one. And if there is another method below us, 
it will be called. If there isn't, this will fall back to the templated version of CS register that we declared at the top of the class, which does nothing and ends the chain. So we've accomplished what we were looking for. But there's a question here. Right here, when we're evaluating the current value of the counter, it is vitally important that we only see overloads of methods that existed above us in the class. Because if not, our counter value is ambiguous. Down here, it is vitally important that we be able to call a method below us that hasn't been declared yet. So question this is part is, of the question, yes. is this well formed? Yes. Does this work? Second one is definitely true because in my practice, body is as if it was applied after the class. It, it, it's within, within, within the curlace. Yes. Yes. So it turns out that the standard says there are three, well, there are four cases where a class is considered to be complete and you can use all of its members without respect to the order they appeared. The first and most obvious one is after the closing curly of the class. Obviously the class, the class is complete, complete, it's fully defined, everything's fine. The other one, which most people are familiar with, is within the curly braces of an inline method definition. Mm -hmm. The class is considered complete in this scope, and therefore you can call things which haven't been declared yet. The other, one, the other two are, it is considered to be complete after the equal sign that declares a default value for a parameter. Which, which is a little bit surprising, but if you think through it, it kind of makes sense. The other case where a class is considered to be complete, and remember, the class had better not be complete in this context, because if the class is complete, we have weird mutually recursive counters that depend on each other and none of this works. The rule says a class is considered complete after the equal sign that initializes a static non-const data member. Fortunately, this data member is const. So the class is not complete in this context. So we're guaranteed to only see overloads that came above us in which, the body of the class. Which is why we mentioned the difference between 11 and 14, with 11 with const expert being const const expert, and in 14 we need the const for const expert. Yes, we need both pieces. So we just changed our code to be 14 compliant, even though we're still trying to support just 11. The const is what, we, we really need that const in so there. I, I Otherwise believe, we fail the rule. Yeah, I believe in 14, if you take the, the word, word const, const off here, here, you have an expression that's evaluated at compile time. However, the initializer Sorry. is in a context where the class is complete and the system doesn't work. There's a question. Well, actually my main concern was the clause somewhere in the standard about how if it would have found a different overload in another context, then the behavior is undefined, no diagnostic required. But I don't know if that rule applies in this case. No, no. because in this case, there is no ambiguity. There is always a best overload available in every context. But there's a really cool, special little thing that when GCC, you don't see it right now. But with Clang, there's one really fun factor if you look at the output. So as, as a reminder, so we've got this wrapped integer. Yes being used to compute all of these const expert values, being used to compute the types that we're going to use to create the overload set for the registration methods, mm -hmm. and then a templated method to end the recursion. What's amazing is if you compile this with the current version of Clang, it sees this tail call, it sees the structure of all of this code, it sees through all of it, it inlines all of these registration methods together and throws out all of the wrapped integer classes and optimizes this to one single registration method. So this is a zero cost abstraction to get this to happen. GCC doesn't do quite as well. It doesn't inline all the methods together. It still throws out all the wrapped integers. But I thought that was quite impressive and I always tip my hat to the Clang programmers for, uh, the Clang optimizer yes. programmers mm -hmm. for being able to actually understand the meaning behind this code and do it despite how torture the syntax is to create this effect. And remember, all of this is set up inside our macros. And the macro isn't that big, but it's all happening. And this is the way we were able to implement reflection. It really does work. 
Um, we would love for C++ to have some things so we could simplify a few pieces, but it replaces mock. It allows reflection, and it probably solves an amazing number of issues we've never even considered, and, and we'd love to start taking a list of how else you could use it. Um, I do want to actually mention, this is version 3. Version 1 kind of didn't look great, and version 2 never saw the light of day. Um, I, we're happy with version 3. It's been blessed by some of the people with Clang, and it really does work. But a lot more does happen at compile time and starting up. Yes? So, are you happy with the, um, the, the kind of proposal for reflection uh, by Axel Nauman? So there's been a lot of conversion yes. in, in, in the, the, the reflection working group, and it seems like that one's getting quite a bit more traction than anything else. It's it's you know it works because there's an implementation, <laughs> so so mm -hmm. you know it's more detailed than anything else. I think. I how recent is that proposal? Because I'm not aware. Of it. It's from the last mailing. The last okay. mailing. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that. We've I'm been saying. talking with a few people about it, and. Um, Part of it is how to make this apply. What we've sort of heard is, this is fantastic for what we're doing, and the Clang people are like, mm, change it a little bit so it's more general. And we're like, we're looking at some things, we're working with some people, that's part of what this week is about as well, is working with some people. We'd love to look at that proposal as well. We had been watching the group as well in terms of other proposals that got rejected. Um, like I said, some. People have looked at this and said, oh, that's, that's not a bad way to do it. But they, ha they want to make this useful for other things other than just copper spice and things like that, a more general reflection. Right. The, the and, reason and, I'm asking sure. is the other way around. I want to make sure that his proposal meets your use. Ah, interesting, yes. interesting. And, Thank and you. Thank you for space, it's valid. Yes. I don't care about meeting just that one. I yes. want theirs to meet yours. We, we do, too. That's, that's very fair. We would, too. The one, um, the one thing that we've looked at various reflection proposals, uh -huh. um, although I don't know that one specifically, so I'll have to go back and look at that, but reflection is 90% of the problem that we have to solve here. The other piece that we needed the macros for was to generate the signal methods. And that's obviously not related to reflection directly, uh -huh. but it's something which really should be addressed as part of that because once you have reflection in the language, you really want to be able to uh, have a richer language for inserting implementation details into parts of the class that you're reflecting. We, we had actually suggested something with expanding attributes, but if you've read any of the stuff, attributes have sort of gotten shot down. Um, the other one is trying to integrate this in with mixins, and to, to integrate that, to add mixins in with this, and, and make that work as a way of implementing reflection. So we're looking at some ideas of that as well. Doing a proposal is challenging. So. Well, at this point in time, I believe a new proposal about reflection would not be welcome. <laughs> um, it, would, it would be listened to. We, we've yeah. actually been talking to the appropriate people, and um, there's a subcommittee that's starting to form um, of, some, of some people uh, just a, a group of some people in our local C++ area um, trying to submit some stuff. So I'm not sure it's not welcome as it's really hard, really hard to implement. So in the meantime, we're really happy that we found a way that's efficient, solves a problem, and that Clang is not going to optimize away, and GCC is not going to get rid of either. So, mm -hmm. um, so. The cost. What, what does this registration <laughs> actually cost? Well, as I said, at runtime, this really boils down to a single method call on Clang. And on GCC, it's just a set of method calls, one for each registered item. Yes, sir? Yes. Um, there's a small issue with Visual Studio. We have some possible workarounds. The problem is, even with Visual Studio 2015 Update 2, they do not support s -fine -a, they do not support full implementation of decal type. Const expert is a little flaky. So um, we're having some issues on the Microsoft side. Um, we've been waiting and waiting. We would love to support it. We were chatting with the Clang people, and it's like, just turn on Clang. We do know that the, because Visual Studio is going to a Clang front end. And um, so that's going to be our workaround, is to use Clang as a front end 
for Visual Studio because we recently found a blog that explains some of the problems with Dackle type and um, they're using a one pass compiler and, and it's a mess. When the explanation of why a feature doesn't always work involves the word heuristic, you start to worry yeah. about the implementation of the <laughs> compiler. <laughs> I'm, I'm more the Windows person, he's more the Linux Debian person, and we flip a coin on Mac um, of who gets stuck with it. Um, <laughs> I think I lose most of the time. I'm not a Visual Studio user, but I understand the power to add it in um, so that we can support it. And the moment we can, we will. We have a contribu um, contributor right now who's trying to clean up some of the code, but then it's like, oh, wait a minute, that part didn't work with Visual Studio. So we, we haven't forgotten it. And at some point, Visual Studio will ship a compiler that supports 11. Plus 11. So yeah, 11. Yeah. then we'll be ready. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things we did want to mention about, because we feel it's important to talk about where the costs are. There's some people that have said, well, well um, there's a lot of relocations in Copper Spice. Yeah, we, we use templates. But I'm not sure that that's a benchmark that's going to really speak to um, something everybody's paying attention to. Um, I want runtime performance. I, I, I don't know if I care as much about startup as much. But because, like Ansel said, we do some of this registration in a very lazy fashion, it's not noticeable in terms of starting up an application. If you do benchmark it and you count our relocations, there's a lot of templates. There's a number. However, on the other hand, and at runtime, yes. since Activate is a template and it's not casting everything all over the place, the compiler actually understands what the code means. And it can optimize much, much more effectively. And, well. and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have a benefit because of the templates with more static type checking and more things optimized. I am sure Clang is going to keep getting even better, and so will GCC, and they're going to understand um, what we're doing. So yeah, we pay a price of templates, but then we get a benefit of, like I said, static checking and being able to optimize code out. And this is sample mock code. We thought we would show it. This is current code. We took a Q push button, we ran it off uh, Qt5. This is just a way to compare what's really happening. Um, we didn't take the spaces out. We didn't actually even clean it up to post it. We did split it into two slides to try to make it more readable. But this is what we have gotten rid of by our registration. And as per my earlier point, compiler designers are not going to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. writing optimizations that make this code fast. Mm -hmm. This is not C++ code that you want to encourage people to write. So it's not a bad thing, it's just we're taking a different approach. And then... Oh, that was just the... I'm not a fan of reinterpret casts. <laughs> I'm, that's why they're in red. Yeah, I, just, I, I particularly like this third line here. I'm still... We still have no idea what it does. <laughs> we're still really, really, really annoyed. Yeah. And you can see where all the void stars were and everything, and they, they lost everything in terms of... Oh, that, was it the previous slide? Yes, we, well, everything's getting cast all over the place and stuff. So what we feel like we've done is we got rid of mock. We got rid of the bootstrap process with copper spice. We got rid of QMake. We're in auto tools. We're in CMake. CMake, I should say that more profoundly. Yay, CMake now. And we've now taken the signal slots out. Um, for those of you that are coming to Ansel's talk later on Thursday, he's going to be talking about another new library we've released, which is going to allow us to refactor our own signal slot library through some threading wonderful stuff. So we have Copper Spice. Um, if you're a cute user and you say, ooh, want to switch over, but you didn't want to have to change everything, we have Peppermill. Peppermill is something, it's a parser that I wrote um, because I was not going to convert um, all the, all, everything I needed from Qt to Copper Spice, and we've made that available. The Signal Slot Library is what we've been showing. LibGuarded is Ansel's new library that he's going to show on Thursday. And if you're like, well, gee, I really don't know what Qt or Copper Spice could do, Kitchen Sink is a program. The 30 demos, some of them are straight out of Qt, others are ones I wrote. 
It's not optimized code, but it is just a set of demos that show we could just move it over and use it straight in Copper Spice. Um, Diamond, um, if any of you um, are Windows programmers and used to use Crimson, or were a fan of Crimson in the old days, um, I completely rewrote it using Copper Spice because I'm not an Emacs or a VI person. So, another argument. <laughs> and um, so, anyway, Diamond is a standalone editor. Um, and like I said, if you were a Crimson user, you would really like it. And Ansel didn't understand why I liked Diamond so much until I showed him how I could uh, create macros on the fly. Then he, then he liked it. And DoxyPress and a DoxyPress app, uh, we're going to be doing a talk tomorrow on DoxyPress. It is a fork of Doxygen. So we're going to be showing that tomorrow. And just some information, if you want to, to download any of this stuff, uh, we put the actual download um, link for the CS Signal. Everything's up. You can get to all the links from our download page. If you want uh, Git repos, we have that as well for Copper Spice and for um, DoxyPress. Those are available. But this is where you would find uh, binaries and source. It's all available up there. So. That's what we have. We hope you like the signal library, Copper Spice, and want to work with us, join us, submit something, patches, suggestions, or questions. Yes? Um, when I saw the um, CSMs, I love that tactic, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, when I saw the C CSMs, um, you know, setting up that inheritance chain, uh -huh. where I thought you were going with that was to introduce a method on CSNs so that you call the last one and then it would call its base class method and propagate the chain of calls that way. Hmm. Um, I wonder if you could do that and if there are, you know, I thought of that while you were presenting it and cool. I just wondered if that was an alternative that you would have tried and rejected if I'm not seeing something about that. Um. So I, we didn't consider that. Yeah. But thinking through that, as you mentioned this, <laughs> the problem is that you have to come up with something that that is syntactically valid inside the body of a class, and you don't have to worry about public or private um, visibility issues and things like that. If we were to do a integer wrapper, uh, first of all, you would have to have a separate. Um, CS int nested inside every class that used the registration mechanism, I believe, because you would have to declare specializations of it within the class. And I'm, I'm not sure how you could get that to work out syntactically. There's, there's not that many things that can appear within the body of a class, and there's a surprising number of things that don't work the way you would expect. The other challenge that you would get into there, then, is that's a method call going to a separate class, and it's not clear. Well, one of, one yeah. of the issues that we're in is when we're looking at any class, like Q push button or tree view, it doesn't matter the class. Obviously, we have no idea how, how many signals and slots. There's other things that get registered other than signals and slots and invocable methods and enums and flags and all sorts of things. So we have no idea how many are going to be called. I, I think the, we did find one, like I said, that went to about 60. So this was one of the effects, is that that was one of our other concerns, is it's an unknown number. And um, we don't run into a problem because every class, again, starts from zero. So we did want it chaining. And I think that's why we thought about it the way we were doing it, is that we wanted one to call two so that it happened automatically. So we didn't have to invoke anything. But more, more directly, I think um, a partial answer would be with the code structured this way, the csint class is only used to compute const expr values. It's never used at runtime. So I think yeah. it's easier for the compiler to see that it's only used at compile time and discard it completely. So you might be able to get there using inheritance to actually call the parent class up the chain. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure it would be an improvement. Okay. I don't say that it would be an improvement. I simply, I thought that was where you were going. Ah, I yes. Try. No, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, a couple times when we've shown 
that counter and stuff, people got lost to what value was, which is why I always want to point out that value was a data member, because people were getting lost between type traits and stuff, and, we're, and it was like, uh, no, we do want it to be called value, it makes sense. Just little things like that we did run into later on. Um, you can simplify it by one line. You can. <laughs> We did think of, of, of doing it um, as a structure and not as a class. But again, most of it gets taken out and stuff because it is compile time. Um, I, I know it's one of those things that uh, we were sitting there going, okay, we, no, we need a new registration. It's, it's like in, we found something that was similar to this online um, that was sort of a motivation and we were looking at it and it wasn't quite the same. And then we looked at it and it generated 500 because it was using friends everywhere. And it was an interesting thing. It was also in either German or French, so the comments were a little harder to read for us. And Ansel's German was not quite up to par when it came to comments on source code. Um, but we were looking through it, and it was like, okay, one line at a time we can do this. But then we tried to compile it. It was like four or 500 friend compiler errors. Warnings. Uh, warnings, warnings, only warnings. Yeah. And it was because everything had to be friended. And so we're like throwing pieces out and what's very interesting doing this is I have a habit of going, what if we do this? And Ansel's, Ansel knows the standard, and, and he's got his photographic memory. And, I, and I'm like, well, what if we did something absolutely crazy? And we did this. And he goes, well, yeah, of course we're going to use a template. What else is left? And then I'm like, quick, read the standard, all 1,800 pages. Are we violating anything? He's like, okay, give me a minute. You know, and it, it, was, it was an exciting experience. Because it started working before we realized it. So that's just the inside information to what happened. I, I just want to say that the way, when I saw you doing that CSM thing, the way I, what I was expecting was that you were going to pass the line number as the parameter and then start with a huge number at the end and then have it, each one call the number below it ah. and then count backwards. Which is slightly simpler but has the, the problem of the huge in charge of the chain. Yes. 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 The huge in and then if you implement that the obvious way, you actually have a huge runtime method call chain as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that turns out not to work because the, the, um, the template recursion depth limit in most compilers is too small right. to make that work. Yeah, 255 is where, where we're at. 255 is, is the limit on most versions of GCC. And, and our standards person who, who look at it, looked at it and said, is that causing you a problem? He said, what's your normal depth? And we said, it's usually 20 or 30 and 60. And he said, well, do you notice any speed problems? Because you're going from 255 down. And I said, well, that's a hard thing to benchmark. And he goes, no, d does it look bad? And I said, no. And he goes, ah, then don't worry. <laughs> you know, and it's like, cool. I, this is a good way to benchmark. Because so, apparently, apparently overloaded method resolution deletion. is quadratic at compile time. But our numbers are small enough that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. C++ is hard enough to parse. That's where all the time goes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes? Did you see a lot of adoption from the Qt community? Oh, they're using our stuff? Um, mean switching over to using your stuff? They're, um, I don't know the legality of that um, because of the CLA problem. Because again, if we signed their CLA, then they can take our stuff and put it in the proprietary version and not put it in the open source version. I mean the, the users of Qt. Oh, the users of Qt. Um, yeah, users of Qt are, are, are starting to migrate. Um, the biggest thing when we started presenting this stuff is, hey, I use a Q object, and I really like to make a template. I really like to inherit something, and whether it's Q, I mean, Q future, I mean, that was an extreme example. But somebody just wanted to use a template, and it's like, um, we've been watching the threads. Um, and people are saying, well, why can't we do that? It's like, well, because there's limitations in mock. So um, they're looking at possibly making some changes in 2025. To, they're waiting for reflection. They thought that they were going to get mock as the way of reflection in 17. That was their submission. If, you, if you've probably read that <laughs> along the way. They had submitted mock as the solution and that got rejected and stuff. So again, nothing against them. What they did was great. It's just a 20-year-old product. Qt spent their time developing functionality, not leveraging C++. And we just love C++. 
So that's what we wanted to leverage first. So, anything else we can answer? Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate it.